welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, uh, the show about citizenship, freedom, liberty, justice in the 21st century. As many of you know, uh, we did a film last year, How to Fix Democracy, which I have to say was intellectually one of the great challenges, frustrations and joys of my life. And it's really nice then to meet uh, a sister artist, someone who has also made a film about democracy, how to fix it. Uh, she made a film called What is Democracy? Her name is Astra Taylor, and she's our guest on today's show. Uh, Astra, in uh, How to Fix Democracy, the movie and some of the interviews, uh, I always ask my guest uh, a simple but I guess silly question. So uh, about democracy. Uh, for the film, I asked at the beginning what democracy sounds like. We had lots of uh, conversations about Beethoven and democracy. I also asked them what democracy smelt like. I had a wonderful conversation with the, the Turkish political writer Eci Temelkuren about the smell of onions climbing up the Acropolis. But for you as a filmmaker, as a woman whose eye is always firmly behind the camera, perhaps we might begin uh, with another kind of question. What does democracy look like? I love that question. It's so great to, that we approach these, this topic of democracy cinematically, one asking what is and one asking how, because these questions are, are so important. What does democracy look like? It's interesting. That question actually gets to the heart of what kicked me off on this trajectory, because I think the seed for the film was planted in the famous chant that I'm sure many of your listeners have heard. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. So that's the chant you hear at every protest. And what, what the people who say it are communicating is that democracy looks like a protest. It looks like people in the street with their placards demanding their rights. And when I've been in those events and I've been in many of them, I've always wondered, is this what democracy looks like? Democracy looks like so many things. It looks like people deliberating, it looks like people arguing, it looks like people voting, it looks like people um, actually just being safe and secure in their homes, right? There's an element I think of democracy that would just look very banal, very mundane, right? I mean, it's just people being able to enjoy their lives, enjoy their freedoms. So what I, you know, I really, the film is me exploring exactly that question and um, trying to avoid some visual cliches and to show all the other ways democracy could look. So in the film, it looks like students in a classroom. It looks like trauma surgeons in a hospital. It looks like political rallies. It looks like refugees trying to find safety and security. Democracy looks like a whole lot of things. When it comes to looking, uh, Astra, I think we tried in some ways to look in the same places. We both traveled with our camera teams to uh, 21st century Greece, to Athens. Uh, but we were on a quest, I think, or I certainly was on a quest as a filmmaker, and I get the sense you were too. You begin your film in Athens uh, talking to uh, scholars of antiquity, trying to quite literally dig up uh, to do some visual archaeology of, 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 of where democracy came from. What did you find in Athens? Athens, you know, it's, it's a place I wanted to approach both with kind of uh, reverence because it is such a critical historical touchstone, but also not affirming, um, not affirming or further mythologizing it. So I think it's really important to ground our discussion of Athens and the fact that you know democracy as a practice isn't something the ancient Greek, the ancient Greeks came up with. Democracy as a practice was sort of generated. If we're just talking about people deliberating and deciding how to run their societies, that's something that human beings did in all sorts of places. But the Athenians, they gave us the word we use, demos and kratos, democracy. And there's so much we can learn from reflecting on that history. Um, you know, I, I also went there because I'm someone who in all of my films it explores topics that are explicitly philosophical. So this, this film and, and the project, that, the writing project that emerged from it isn't just a political film, it's a philosophical film. So I went there also so I could engage with Plato and Plato's foundational text of Western uh, of the Western philosophic tradition, the Republic. Um, and so what I found was a society where many of the issues that the ancients raised were still being grappled with, right? Because what I wanted to show in 
what is democracy? I'm sure this is why you went back to Athens too, is that a lot of the struggles we're having, they're not new. <laughs> they're not uh, just the result of technology. They're not just the result of polarization that's happened since 2016 when Trump was elected, but actually there are these almost timeless democratic dilemmas. More literally what I found when I went to Athens to 21st century Athens was a, a society that was being uh, roiled by two crises that were intersecting one an economic crisis. So there was, um, they were in the middle of a huge financial catastrophe. Um, this is the country was deeply in debt and uh, there was massive austerity. So public services were being cut. Uh, people were really struggling. It was you know, essentially a, a, a crisis of Great Depression proportions. And then there was also the refugee crisis. So Greece was sort of the gateway for hundreds of thousands of migrants from Syria, uh, you know, mainly, but also from Afghanistan, from elsewhere in the Middle East. And so the society was really having to cope with these two crises. So that put a lot of democratic issues right there into stark relief. So I was able to explore these timeless themes, these timeless dilemmas through these very contemporary, very timely uh, crises. And, and what intrigues me about your film and, and, and our film is that we were drawn in Athens to the same physical location, mm -hmm. to the same geography. We were both drawn to the Agora. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on this too. I mean, the Agora, as someone says in my film, the Agora is the place where people get together. So it was the public space of Athens, it, you know, and, and that resonates, right? Because when we think of democracy, we think about the public square. We, we think about spaces for deliberation, spaces where people come together and interact and share their ideas. And the Agora was literally that. It was both a literal marketplace. So it was where you do your shopping, but it was also where you'd go to have conversations. And what, what is remarkable about Athenian democracy, you know, people, I think it is important to begin with the standard, the standard caveats. Athens was a slave-based society. It was very restrictive in terms of who counted as a citizen. And it became uh, more restrictive over time in terms of, um, uh, you know, limiting who was able to inherit citizenship from their parents. It was also, um, you know, so it was a slave-based society and it was one that also totally excluded women from public life. So that, the thing is, at, but the thing is at that point in history, that was really common. <laughs> Many societies were mm. patriarchal, they were slave-based. What was remarkable and exceptional about Greece, uh, about Athens, sorry, is that it had a system of, a system in which people were not subjects of a lord, right, or a king, uh, a monarch, but where they were citizens who were running their society democratically. And it was incredibly democratic, even by our standards today. So for example, any per, any man, young man who counted as a citizen could basically, basically expect to serve in the equivalent of Congress in their lifetime. You would be called up to serve in the council. You would be, um, and be expected that you would go to the assembly and, and to these massive open air meetings and decide, and you would be compensated for your participation. So if you happen to be poor, if you were an artisan or a farmer, the city state compensated you for your, you know, gave you a day's wages so you could basically miss work to become a citizen, to participate in the life of the city, the political life of the city. So that means the Agora was even more significant. It wasn't just where you would go and say, oh, I read the news today. It doesn't really matter what I think because I'm not really, I'm not in Congress, right? I'm not in this, the city council, but hey, I have some opinions. I'm keeping up with the news. No, you are actually gleaning information that then you would use to literally govern. What is, and I know this is a rather technical and, and dry question, but I, I don't know the answer to it. And I know you've done more thinking on this than I have. What's the relationship between citizenship and democracy? Do all democracies have citizens? And can one be a citizen uh, outside a democracy or are they essentially the same things? Mm. I mean, a citizen, right, it's a legal category, right? Are you a citizen of the United States? Do you hold an American passport? Um, you know, and what that citizenship entitles to you are rights and protections and freedoms, right? So if you are a citizen in the United States, you are entitled to vote. For me, it's very important to decouple democracy and civic participation from citizenship. And I don't know what your background is, but I've spent the majority of my life in the United States since I was a child, but I wasn't a citizen. 
And so in my book- And you came was, from Canada, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I came from, from Canada, but I grew up in Georgia. I'm basically a Southerner. That's where I spent my childhood. And, um, and so I eventually went through the legal process and I talk about this in the book that goes with the film, What is Democracy? Talk about what it meant for me to re sort of claim my birthright citizenship, which came to me through a very roundabout means. My grandfather was American and he worked as a border agent in Winnipeg, Canada. Right? So I am a citizen not because I live here and I'm part of the community and I'm very concerned about American affairs, but because of my grandfather's job. But I think it's really, it's just an illustration of how arbitrary it is in a way. I mean, I could have naturalized, but basically what was decided was that I was always a citizen. You know, and for me, I was very much an activist. I was very civically engaged, even though I, I didn't have the ability to vote. And if you look at the history of democracy, that's often the case. It's often people who are excluded, who are outside the boundaries of citizenship, who push democracy forward. They both pushed for inclusion in the demos. They pushed for citizen rights, for those protections, for those freedoms. But by doing so, they expanded our conception of democracy. They transformed our democracy. You know, They improved it. And so outsiders, part of what I want to do in my work on democracy is just give credit to those outsiders, those people on the margins or even excluded entirely, who are pushing to make democracy more than it is. I also think it's always interesting to go back and recall that in the early days of this country, of the United States, you could actually be a non-citizen and have voting rights. So there are countries, New Zealand's a great example, where as long as you are a resident, you have the rights to participate in elections, uh, in some municipal governments here, I think in San Francisco where you are, non-citizens can vote in school board elections. So there's actually, I think, a strong argument that citizenship should be based on residency, where you are, what community you're part of, and not this arbitrary thing of, you know, what sort of blood or soil, as it's called, which is like, what, what were your parents, right? What citizenship were they? Can they pass it on to you? Or what dirt were you born on? Because that's very arbitrary, as you said, and unfair and leads to what is often described as a lottery. Astra, the traditional narrative, as you know, on democracy is that the kernels of it, the, the origins existed in, in, the, in the Greece of antiquity, and then they got lost for a couple of thousand years and, and, and rebuilt by us Westerners in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, by Lockean liberals, and which eventually flowered, if that's the right word, into the modern democracies of, of the United States and Western Europe. Your movie, though, I think, plays around with this narrative. Uh, you have a, a, a wonderful section, I think the most memorable section in, in, in the film uh, is an interview you did with the Italian-American feminist Silvia Federici. Uh, you did the interview in Siena, I think it was in a, a 15th century building uh, with wonderful frescoes on the wall. Um, and in it, perhaps you can clarify my, my interpretation, Federici reminds us to go back to the Middle Ages in terms of making sense of the problems with contemporary democracy. Sylvia Federici is a wonderful figure. She's an activist and a scholar, and she's someone I actually met in the streets at a protest where people were chanting, this is what democracy looks like. Her work focuses on the Middle Ages for multiple reasons. I mean, I think mainly because that is the beginning of the capitalist system we now live with. And you really can't talk about democracy without talking about capitalism, right? I mean, in the liberal imagination, these things are synonymous, right? So what is democracy? Well, it's free and fair elections and it's open markets, right? I mean, so this is a really strong tradition when we're talking about that Lockean tradition. John, John Locke was a huge part of framing it. Sylvia, says, well, we have to look at the Middle Ages when enclosure was happening, when communal lands were being privatized, when the feudal system was being challenged by capitalist imperatives. But you know, some of those hierarchies carried over into the capitalist system. And, um, and, and especially uh, gendered relations. So she, she looks a lot about how um, women lost power in the Middle Ages because as sort of communal uh, access to lands was restricted, women were pushed further into the domestic sphere. We were talking, as you pointed out, in Siena, Italy, uh, at a, at a, in a fresco that would have been painted at a time when the government was a kind of small r republic, an Italian city state, right? And so that is 
that is not democracy by our modern standards, but it's a, it is a democratization. It's part of the story of democracy we're telling. It's also significant that we are in Siena because it is the site of the first bank. <laughs> and the Bank of right. Siena is the longest continually existing bank in the world, right? I mean, it's still fun, it's still operating today. So again, I'm trying to get at you know the seeds of democratization of Republican kind of self-government and and the origins of modern finance because I think that's very important. It's very important that we tell those stories together. Yeah, you 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 write about this in in your new collection of essays, uh, "Remake the World," a really a, a, a rich collection, uh, Astra, which you dedicate to your friend David Graeber, who who wrote the book on debt. How how do you connect the problems with contemporary democracy? and De uh, Graeber and other activists, including yourself, take on the nature of debt in contemporary capitalism? Debt has exploded. And I think when we talk about capitalism's relationship to democracy, we absolutely have to talk about indebtedness. It's not enough to talk about inequality, the huge divide between the rich and the poor. It's certainly not enough to talk about poverty, just the fact that some people don't have enough to get by and are food insecure, et cetera. You know, we have to t acknowledge that the average American has less than zero. They're indebted. Um, and they're indebted because they are not paid enough at work and they do not have access to social services. So we have to borrow to get an education. We have to put our medical bills on credit cards because we are not offered universal health care. So the lack of social services, stagnating wages have led to this explosion of debt and easy access to credit since the 1970s has created this illusion of prosperity. So my wager as an activist, this is less as a, a writer or a filmmaker, is that actually our debts are a source of power for people because debts are somebody else's assets. When you are indebted, that's on somebody else's balance sheet. They're planning it in their future projections. So if debtors could, can come together, they can kind of collectivize their debts and collectively bargain then for write downs, for debt cancellation, and ideally build a kind of political awareness and political power where they can say, we need to get to the root of this. Medical debt shouldn't exist. Medical debt doesn't exist in Canada. It doesn't exist in Denmark, right? Because these, these societies have public health care. And so let's change the way that uh, necessary essential services are offered so that we don't have this crisis. But it's not just, I think it's really important to take a historical lens. I mean, debt isn't just a democratic problem today. There wouldn't have been a democratic Athens if it wasn't for debtors revolting. So the very early um, revolts were actually among debtors who were, who were basically farmers who were falling into arrears and selling themselves and their families into debt slavery, right? Is what led to the initial democratic reforms that set the stage for Athenian democracy. That story then repeats in ancient Rome. When you have, uh, you finally have the establishment of the tribune of the, of the people, right? Um, that's because debtors revolted and basically went on a general strike. So what you see throughout history, it's really fascinating to me, is uh, basically debtors getting to a point over and over again where they can't take it anymore. And they rise up uh, in order to push for some kind of democratic change. So I think in that sense, you know, the debtors I organize with through a group called the Debt Collective, we're just part of this long democratic struggle. Astra, I think one of the interesting debates that's particularly come out of our third series on citizenship and how to fix democracy is, is questioning the standard narrative that uh, Westerners uh, brought democracy to the rest of the world and, bought, and brought imported or exported the idea of democracy uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting discussions about how we can learn from the indigenous peoples, particularly of, 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 of North and, and, and South America in terms of organization and democracy. In your movie, Silvia Federici um, touches on this. She, she seems to suggest that we have as much to learn from the indigenous peoples of North America uh, as they do from us. Um, and that what really happened, and, and this comes out of, of course, Siena and the bank and the uh, 
uh, the colonial nature of, of capitalism, uh, that to make sense again of, of contemporary capitalism, uh, we need to incorporate or reincorporate um, indigenous traditions into our conception of democracy. Yes, it's, you know, it's one of those moments that led me on a path of learning. So when Sylvia said that in the interview, and it struck me so powerfully. So what, what she points out is that ideas that we now associate with the Enlightenment, with the early days of democracy. So for example, a figure like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, right? That these weren't ideas that emerged spontaneously from the imaginations of, of Europeans. It was the ideas of freedom, of self-rule, of equality were actually um, ideas they had gleaned from contact with the indigenous people of the Americas. Because, and it makes sense, right? Because you think back to what it would have been like to be living in Europe in the 1500s, 1600s, right? Equality wasn't a part of your daily life. You lived in a system of intense inequality. Inequality was just taken as totally natural. And also you weren't a citizen, you were a subject of, of the king. And so what it took was this radical encounter with people who lived differently for these ideas to even be possible, right? And then they traveled back across the Atlantic, back across the ocean and inspired these new ways of, of thinking, this, these new philosophical and political possibilities. And so I guess it's, it's important to see that, you know, what was going back and forth, what, what was being taken from these colonial settlements wasn't just resources or, or people, right, but actually ideas. And that democracy was strong in, in North America before European contact. And so in the, the book, um, uh, democracy may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone, which is the companion to what is democracy. I explore this much more because it was, you know, I think it's such a, an essential part of the narrative, especially for those of us who live in the United States. And I look at the Haudenosaunee or what is often called the Iroquois Confederacy. And, you know, the founding fathers had a lot of contact with, with Haudenosaunee society and were, you know, and marveled, Benjamin Franklin marveled at their systems of government. And it's important to note too, that not only was this society highly democratic and, you know, this wasn't just some small group, right? This was a confederacy of many different tribes of nations coordinating and working together, but it was also very feminist by our standards and that the ultimate power holders um, were the clan mothers, were the elder women of the community. And so there you have, you know, and so you have not only a much more egalitarian democratic uh, society there, but also one that is centuries ahead of us in terms of acknowledging women as full political beings. In your movie, you introduced the notion of Rousseau's paradox, which I thought was also fascinating. The idea that democracy uh, and civic religion or modern democracy and civic religion may indeed be antithetical. We can have one, but we can't have them both. What is Rousseau's paradox? Rousseau's paradox is, is very intuitive once you see it. So he asks a basic question. What comes first, the people who are capable of democracy or the institutions that help make those people capable of democracy? So we all kind of accept this, right? That Democracy requires a kind of cultivation, a kind of education, a civic education. Rousseau would call this a civic religion, right? So some kind of, you know, uh, shared understanding of the importance of communal life, of, of you know, caring for uh, the, the well-being of one another, for self-government. And so it's a real challenge, right? Because there's also always been this sort of, um, I, I can see it even in, in people when I would interview with them about democracy, like, oh, if only someone would just come up with the perfect system and the perfect rules, and then we could just do it. But who create, that's never gonna happen, right? So, and I say that because Rousseau ended up addressing his own paradox by imagining that as a, as a possibility, that some enlightened person would just intervene in this paradox, put a good system into place, and then we would just have to have to follow their lead. Reality is a lot more messy, right? And so we're always in that paradox. We're always educating each other, cultivating certain sensibilities, changing our institutions. Uh, and that process to me just seems, seems like an ongoing one. 
it did get me thinking about paradoxes in general. And, and what I came to is the idea that part of why democracy is so complicated and often frustrating and difficult to enact is that it contains many paradoxes, not just Rousseau's paradox, but you always have to hold these elements that are in tension. So the fact that you know, we live in communities, we live in a, a locale on the micro level, but we have to be con concerned with the broader globe, right? We have to think globally as we act locally. So there's a geographic tension in democracy. We have to think about our present condition and worry about the future. We have to balance something like expertise, which only a few possess with mass opinion, the fact we all get to have a say. You know, and not everyone can be experts in everything. So there's all these paradoxical aspects. Um, and unlike Rousseau, we can't just cheat and imagine someone solving them for us. Well, I think one of the central paradoxes in your movie was that the tragedy in the movie is, is I think, exemplified by refugees. It's a, it's a heartbreaking film in many ways about uh, how, how, how terrible life is for refugees who have no citizenship. And of course, the iron and, and, and you film this in Greece uh, after the, 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 the Syrian civil war and the, the Arab Spring. The irony, of course, is that in 2010, the Arab Spring, particularly in Silicon Valley, was treated as a positive event. The Internet was supposed to liberate, to enable democracy. And the Internet, of course, has added to the paradox of democracy. You've written about this. Uh, in your career, you're one of Silicon Valley and, and, and modern technology's big critics. Um, originally, Rousseau was resurrected, I guess, uh, at Astra by people like uh, your friend uh, Clay Shirky uh, a, a, as a place of the common space which would bring people together. Uh, but that dream has soured, hasn't it? It has soured, it has soured. I wonder if you feel this way at all because you and I were both early, quite critical tech critics, right? We didn't pull our punches very much. Uh, and what's striking to me is how the public discourse has changed from this very boosterous cheerleading that you know, my book, The People's Platform, which is a, a critical political economy of tech came out in 2014, um, but then, uh, and I would, time this to the election of Donald Trump in 2016, the discourse totally changed and suddenly it became very dystopian. So social media is destroying our democracy. Uh, the internet is a you know, highway for misinformation. All true, <laughs> there is truth to that. What I've always wanted to keep um, grounded in the conversation is that you know, the problem isn't the tech itself, but it's the underlying incentives. It's the business incentives, it's who built, who's building it and for what. Right. And um, and so I think for me, I still see potential in technology to create the, the public square spaces for deliberation and real enlightenment. We can't do them when we are beholden to the priorities of venture capitalists and Silicon Valley executives who basically just want to reach scale and cash out um, and their priorities are you know, making money uh, and the rest of the world be damned. Right. Doesn't matter if if what if people are using their platforms for hideous things or if they're you know, basically promoting mass confusion um, and, and emotional pain. So you know, I think this was, this was definitely an, a problem with the Arab Spring. I mean, and they, it goes back further, even 2009 was when it first caught my eye when there was the Iranian green, what was it called? Um, the Green Revolution, basically it was the Iranian uprising and Clay Shirky, for example, was like, this is it. This is the Twitter revolution. It's happening. Yeah, I think it was treated as, you know, first we had a Twitter revolution, then a Facebook. And now we're exactly. talking about, you know, TikTok revolutions or Snapchat revolutions, yeah. but they're always the same and they always end in tears, don't they? They do end in tears because ultimately politics is about power. <laughs> it's about power and resources and, you know, Yes, these online platforms are, are, you know, again, can kind of encourage virality. So, you know, they might be able to get lots of people to show up in physical space, you know, maybe in Tahrir Square or, or at Zuccotti Park where Occupy Wall Street was. But that doesn't mean that people are really building this kind of base and social power and longevity that's needed to transform politics. Uh, and so that is, you know, that's been a constant refrain, I think, of my writing and my organizing work is like, how do regular people, how does the demos under conditions of massive inequity, right? So where some people are billionaires and they, and people like Jeff Bezos are 
chomping at the bit to become trillionaires and they have so much influence, how, um, how do regular people actually come together, not just to voice their dissent, but to actually create structural change? And you do that, you know, and you have to, you have to be kind of nuanced. The internet's a part of this process, right? The internet can help us you know, sp spread our messages and get some attention and bring people in, but then you have to do something else. And it's it, technology can't do it for you, which is you have to organize people, bring them into a culture, articulate a strategy, find the levers of, of a political change that you might actually have a chance of reaching, then pull them together and stay in the game over long periods of time. So the lot, you know, virality is not, um, the, not going to get us where we want to be. And this holds true, I think, in the examples of Iran and Egypt, um, but it also applies here in the United States. Well, let's end, um, Astra, on, on remaking uh, those rules. How do we remake them? Uh, I know that uh, Silva, Silvia Federici, I think is someone actually we need to get on this show. Uh, she talks about reintegrating love into the political conversation. I don't know whether it is a conversation, perhaps we might call it the political kiss or embrace. Uh, is there a role for love in, 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 in trying to fix Rousseau's paradox? I mean, public love, right? I mean, lots of our greatest activists have spoken of, of love. I'm thinking of Martin Luther King and his idea of the beloved community. Um, and that there's a kind of, you know, Rousseau spoke of civic religion, but there's a kind of civic love Right, that's very different from the privatized romance <laughs> that we're mm. encouraged to focus on. Right, it's not. Um, it's, it's not the Hollywood love. It's not the Hollywood love, and and I think I have said this actually in my interviews about what is democracy that I wanted to make a love film that wasn't about a couple. Right, that was about this kind of civic love, of concern for our fellows. I think that you know, in a concrete way to actually make what kind of can seem abstract very palpable and, and tied to this moment is that we are seeing this in our conversations about care and care being at the central center of the economy. And this is actually something where I think it's a really wonderful concrete example of what activists can do. So Joe Biden has acknowledged that care work is essential to the economy, that people who are caring for small children, for sick people, for our elders, that that is what makes the world go round. You know, so when we talk about good jobs, we can't just have this sort of nostalgic image of people with hard hats or even, you know, you know, uh, um, you know, truck drivers or even journalists or whatever, that all this work, which tended to be women's work, is actually mm. underpins everything else. Um, so we have, we've now got a situation where this is at the center of the debate. Why is it at the center? Well, in part because of COVID. So what, what the pandemic has done, it just revealed the huge burden of caring for each other. And, you know, women famously, uh, you know, it's, it's just, there's been a lot of discussion about how hard this was on women in particular, because kids weren't going to school, because people were falling ill, and so on. So this crisis, I think there's a tiny silver lining here is that the pandemic has put the issue of care on the political agenda. It wouldn't be there though, if it wasn't for Sylvia Federici. Because what <laughs> Sylvia Federici did in 1970s, with, in the 1970s that she, she banded with a few other women in New York, where she was living at the time, and started something called Wages for Housework. And they were mocked and scorned, but their idea was basically that we are working, you know, that caring for the home, caring for the family is real work and that it should be remunerated. And, and they used Marxist language, so they said, you know, as the, we, t we see the world of work as this factory assembly line, right? People getting paid for their jobs out there, making cars, making widgets. But underneath that assembly line is this whole world of invisible work, making people, <laughs> feeding them, mm. nurturing them, um, caring for them, you know, uh, in times of crisis. And let's bring that up. Let's bring that invisible work up and let's value it. And those activists, you know, a few dozen women in New York who came from different backgrounds, many of them were on welfare, um, pushed that idea. And it has been carried forward by generations of activists since then um, and is finally is having its day. So I think that's an example of, you know, democratic progress and people pushing something that seems very uh, radical, a whole new way of seeing the world. And eventually, you know, the time will come when the rest of 
um, well, every, when everyone else is ready <laughs> to recognize it and see its values. Ultimately, even if you are critical of Silicon Valley and capitalism, you seem positive. You're hopeful in the longer term beyond COVID. I'm not necessarily an optimistic person. I certainly have my pessimistic days, but I've been taking inspiration from a from um, something uh, an activist, Miriam Kaba, recently said, and she said, hope is a discipline. And so that's sort of my, I think that's the spirit I approach these issues in. You know, uh, There's a lot that could be done and that can make things better. A lot of things we could do to fix democracy, to fix the future, uh, but we have to actually do the work, right? We have to stick with it just like Sylvia Federici and her her comrades decades ago, you know, we have to keep kind of bashing our head against the wall until our moment comes. And then we have to seize it and we have to push to the next, the next level. So I think, you know, there are, there are these, the conditions we're operating in are not the worst. That's the other thing the historical perspective gives you, right? Is people have been fighting under much more difficult conditions. Ultimately, um, you know, who are we to complain about the way things are at this moment? It's our duty, I think to it's our duty to be hopeful <laughs> well astra taylor i asked you at the beginning of this conversation what democracy looks like and i think over the last 30 or 40 minutes you've done a wonderful job describing it and it's all it's mm -hmm. frustrating but also potentially um emancipatory paradoxes i want to thank you it's a real honor uh, and a thrill to have you on the show and i hope you'll come back again uh, because I think uh, you have as much to say about democracy and fixing it as anyone around these days. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation.